Good morning from the Rose Garden. It's a beautiful day to be in the Rose Garden. That's what we always say when we come out here to pull those weeds. And I'm hoping by the time we get finished looking and around and enjoying the beauty that you'll be inspired to want to get out here and pull a few weeds with us in the Rose Garden too. Um, this is our rose and perennial garden. Uh, we maintain that as master gardeners and we work hand in hand with the Economic Development Council here in Centerville. They've been so kind as to do a lot of funding for various things uh, financially, and we have committed to maintaining it, pulling those weeds and keeping it up. And uh, it's turned into quite a little haven of beauty, a little bright spot. But uh, I wanted to give a little bit of history of how it got to this point. I'll start out with saying uh, the roses you see here are, are called Sweet Drift. And uh, it's one of the Drift Rose line and it does really well in this community, uh, in this climate and area. As a matter of fact, all the Drift Roses do. Um, coral Drift, Red Drift, uh, Peach Drift, and Sweet Drift are my favorites. They do really, really well. We're going to walk on into the garden, and as we walk in, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history and then look at some specifics, specific plants. Now, mind you, this is dead heat of July, and it's not the best of the blooming season, so our roses are kind of stressed, but they're still amazing, amazingly giving us some beautiful roses in spite of it. So some of them don't look as well as they did, say, last month, but come on and join us. As we enter the gate, and before I get into the history of what was here, I do want you to notice, because everyone does notice, these beautiful vitex. They kind of set the tone for the whole rose garden. And in the spring, and especially in the spring, they are solid like a cloud of purple. And they get comments from all over town all the time about these beautiful trees. and. Uh, they really cause it to look like a little utopia, a little Shangri-La. <laughs> but um, they've done really, really well. It's uh, too much shade sometimes for roses, so we have to keep them trimmed up. But as we walk in, I just want you to know these were planted as some of our first perennials, Texas Star perennial that we were able to put into the ground after our rose trial was complete and they were tiny, tiny, tiny. And this, this is what we have now. So I just wanted to make that point of how beautiful they've become with a lot of pruning and love and uh, cultivation, but they thrive in this county, Vitex, also called the chase tree. Okay. Now, I just wanted to give a little history about uh, the Rose Garden and how it all came about. Uh, back in 2000 and probably seven or eight, our uh, county agent at that time was Tommy Neeland, and the Master Gardeners was a fledgling organization that had started back up after years of not being active, and uh, I think it was Tommy and Mary Sue um, Watson and uh, Charlie Patan at that time, I believe. Uh, I'm not sure of others because I did not come until the next year. <laughs> but um, they were looking for a place to provide volunteer hours for, they desperately needed something and somewhere to be a place for the Master Gardeners to work to provide volunteer hour opportunities. And Tommy talked to the city about this little plot of ground which is right next to the little city park didn't used to be a splash pad park it was just a little park and uh, he talked to them about this which was the old water tower uh, so they were given this little small plot of land it was under a high barbed wire fence as you can see on one side it still has the high barbed wire fence and uh, to give you a little idea about what we 
started with. When I, when I came, my husband and I became Master Gardeners in 2008. And in 2009, they asked me if I would head up the rose uh, garden and maybe we could get involved in the rose trial, which we did. We got involved in the National Earth Kind Rose Trial out of Texas A&M. And uh, I, we had this, pro this little spot. Now, when we walked in that gate and it looked so beautiful, when, what you've just seen as we walked in, when we walked in at that time, we had solid grass, we had iron ore soil, we had creosote posts. The bench that I'm sitting on, I don't know if you can see, but down under it are two huge iron pipes sticking up out of the ground. Over in the bed behind us, another iron pipe. All of those were here and there was nothing but just red iron ore, dirt, and creosote. And uh, so this is what we had to work with. It was an empty space. This beautiful walkway that we now have was not here. It was just all grassy iron ore dirt. Um, when we began the trial, the rose trial, I, I made contact with Dr. Steve George, the head of the horticultural department at Texas A&M, and he provided us with our list of roses that we could use for the rose trial that they had in the testing. Roses in the rose trial to become an earth kind designation had already been through from three to five years of trial in the A&M Horticultural Gardens up in uh, Tarrant County in Dallas and that area at Farmer's Branch. And they had survived and made it through and were able to be put out all over the country in different uh, trials. So he gave us our assignment. We had a randomized rose trial. Uh, three beds, each had five roses, so we had 15 roses. And uh, those roses, when, when we put them in the ground, were this size. If we'll look over here, and I'll tell you more about this rose later, but they were the size of this tiny new rose. All our, all our 15 roses were about that size when we put them in the ground. But before we, before we put them in the ground, we had a lot of work to do because we had to uh, do something about this red iron ore dirt. And the Earth Kind Rose Trial gave us definite criteria that we had to follow. So the first thing we did is, you've sp heard me speak before of uh, getting soils and dirts and mulches from Nature's Way Resources in Conroe. We went down there and we got a trailer load and brought in of the best rose finished compost that they had. And we, we put in three inches in the, in the beds, three inches. So that's the only dirt that was ever hauled in and put on top of that iron ore dirt that we had in here. And uh, we put that in and from, that was in 2009, October of 2009. Put that in, put our little roses in place, which was a randomized trial. We had to, each of the three beds had to have a benchmark rose in the bed to, to compare others to, which was Carefree Beauty, which had already attained the earth kind designation. So each bed had a Carefree Beauty, and then there were four other roses that had been given to us. And then we had to draw their names out of a hat <laughs> uh, for their placement. We couldn't choose just because we couldn't favor one. I like this pink one, I like this peach one. I want it to do better, I'm gonna give it more sun. So I had to take all that out. So it was randomized that how they were placed. They could be two side by side of the same color or whatever. And so they went around all the way down the fence, around the corner around this corner and around, and it would divide it into three distinct beds, one, two, and three. After we put the soil in, we put the roses in, then we put uh, three inches of uh, mulch. 
and since 2009, the only thing that's ever been put in these beds has been, it has had the two, the three inches of mulch has been added to, uh, two times, usually two times a year, uh, early and late, and not and hardwood mulch or native, the chopped up native, like I've gotten free from the city of Buffalo a lot of times is the chopped up stuff that your community does. If you can get your hands on some of that, because it's all the native things that decomposes, because all of that has become our rose dirt. For 11 years now, there's been no dirt put in other than that first compost dirt, except the underside of all the years of native and hardwood compost that is decomposed. Say, your grandma to always told you my mother-in-law, and I've spoken of her when I teach the classes on us, that I always tell us, go out in the woods, rake back that top layer under the trees and get that leaf mold. She called it leaf mold. Dig down and get the leaf mold underneath. Well, that's what this is. It's like a hundred years ago. That was what they had for fertilized. So that is the fertilized, that's the food. No rose in here has ever uh, been treated with pesticides. It's never, they've never been uh, fertilized other than natural. Now, if you use, I'm speaking of earth kind tips, you can use things on your roses like a miracle Grow or, or uh, Osmocote, uh, extra strength, the double Osmocote, or uh, it has a name now, but anyway, the stronger one, those are uh, slower release, those are okay to use. But in this garden, during the three-year trial, nothing, nothing could be, we couldn't even deadhead a rose. We couldn't even pinch a dead rose off. We couldn't prune because that stimulates growth. We could only water and only water a certain way. So, and that's how the trial was done. For three years, we could do nothing and there was no other plant, only those roses. Now those little roses, by the end of the season, that year, were already this big. I mean, they just took off from this soil and treatment they were getting. And uh, kind of proved the point about the earth kind way of planting. They, they required us to plant them eight feet apart from the center. So every tag you ever look at says plant three feet apart. We had to plant eight feet apart. They said, because with earth kind, when you're doing it all the right way, they're gonna be way bigger and they're gonna spread way bigger, which they have. So if you can, let, let's walk over and look at this carefree beauty over here. This is one of the original, this is a carefree beauty benchmark rose. It is an earth kind rose and there's one, was one of these in every bed. I will say this, just now, this year, Number one, let me say, not one of our four roses made the earth kind designation. Although, I still have Simon Estes in my rose garden at home, and I love Simon Estes, but it didn't do well all over the country. Uh, one of our roses was Red Dream. It, it, it struggled the whole time we had it, and it finally died. All of them died in our trial. Uh, this one was uh, Carefree Celebration which was in our trial. And as you can see, it's still thriving. It's a pretty peach color and it really has thrived. Now these were planted in October of 2009 and um, have never had any fertilizer put on them, never had insecticides put on them. And so they've done well. Now not all have lived. We've recently taken some out that were in the trial that just, they. We let them, we enjoyed them as long as we could, which is what I do at home. People say, I can't plant roses, I, they die. I say, plant another one, just enjoy them while you can. That's what we do. Of course, my husband, you know, he hates to hear it when we got to dig that one up and put another one in, but you know, he enjoys them too. He does take time to smell roses. So, um, I do want to point out I think as far as, I did want to finish that little history lesson before I go into pointing out some specific plants. And at the end of our three-year trial, 
when everything was submitted and all was done, then we had to decide what can we do now that the trial is over. And we wanted to incorporate perennials. And, and we decided as a Master Gardener group to turn it into an educational garden with roses and perennials. And so we've tried to incorporate then. See, we couldn't put a shrub in at all at that time. But once it was over, we wanted to incorporate different types of perennials. Now, when I, when I put in these Vitex, they were little shrubs. Little did we anticipate or think that it would end up being trees. It's not the best, not ideal for a rose garden because of the shade. But they're so beautiful and so many people love them that we just keep on trimming them up and making those trunks. They have beautiful architectural beauty. Uh, taking it up higher where the sun can get under because we do have to fight that shade to some degree. And we were allowed then to put in different kind of plants and we'll talk about some of those in a minute. But uh, one of the things we did, and before we leave the history and get on to the grant that we got, I do want to point out that we had, when we started the garden, we had these pipes, I told you about these, ugly, unsightly, dangerous, that people would trip over pipes coming out of the ground. And uh, James Robinson stepped up and said, I'll build a bench to go over. Had a great idea. He was our bench builder. So uh, he built these fine benches, one on each side, and then a great big one in the back. And nobody ever, has to even know about those unsightly pipes we had to get out of the way. And so we really appreciated all the work he did for us here. But um, as we began trying to decide to how to turn this into an educational garden, we had the opportunity to get a uh, grant to facilitate really doing something special in here. And so, uh, a group within the Master Gardeners. I'm not familiar with all the details of that. I'm just the Rose Lady. But they uh, applied, I think, with the help of the EDC, got a grant provided, and with that grant came some landscaping. Uh, they put, But they worked with us uh, with what we wanted in here, and then they put a couple of things they wanted in here, uh, such as, let me think, they wanted the dwarf yopon, which does add, add a touch. Too much of it, and it takes up too much room from your roses, you know. That's, but uh, <laughs> they put in the dwarf yopon. They put in, when they came with the um, landscapers, they put these hollies in. These are fabulous hollies. And I love them, and they're, they are a wall that keeps you from seeing the firehouse. And it really adds a lot to kind of close in this, this little haven of, of growing things on this side. This holly is called Nellie R. Stevens holly. Nellie Stevens holly, and it grows in this way, and it makes a beautiful wall uh, fence of holly if you'd like to use something like that. So this was done along with that grant. Now, the per pergola that we're standing under was also something that they, with the grant, they installed, which we were thrilled to get. added so much uh, to the look of the garden and even shade, even though it does have a lot of sun coming between the boards, but still. <laughs> um, I wanted to point out a couple of uh, plants over here. I wanted to point out this grass. If you are interested in having an airy look of a grass for your landscaping that you don't want something as big as a pampas grass, this um, maiden grass, it is called gracilimus. It's a, per it's a perfect size and it gives, I love the look of a filling in a corner and a spot. We let it 
it it dies after first frost it dies after first frost but we like the brown touch of the airy flow that it gives through the winter then we deadhead it we cut it all off in like february we cut it down to about 18 inches and then it does this again so that's a very good grass to use for if you want something that stays about that size it doesn't get out of hand also this perennial as you can see it takes off i i have I have to cut this back all the time. It's, it, I've got way more than I planned on being there right now. It's a black-eyed Susan, and this particular one is a Texas star. It's Rudbeckia Goldstrom. And it stays that height, and it gets dense and thick if it's happy. This one's happy. <laughs> we also have put Lily of the Nile in places. Now, they've not had their big purple blooms on them yet, but... Um, I want to point out this rose, and I have, uh, anybody that's ever heard me speak on roses or teach on roses, I'll always tell you, if you can only buy one rose, and that's all you've got room for in your yard is one rose, Belinda's Dream. Because now look at this girl. She was, these two were only put in the ground the beginning of last summer as just small roses and this is how they've taken off and you can expect this is mid-july and mine at home are doing the same you can just be rewarded with r roses and they make great cut roses their fragrance is to die for if you look at how they unfurl that's almost a picture perfect uh, rose and they'll they hold for cut roses very well so it's an awesome rose it's belinda's dream it's uh, a shrub rose, and it is an earth kind rose. Um, our rose, I'm disappointed at this time in the summer for what we're, we have with our drift rose, because normally our drift roses, this is a red drift, makes a great barter. And normally, if any of you that have worked here or been here, you know that you will rarely ever catch these roses that they are not... Uh, completely red <laughs> as you can see they've just finished if you can see all the tiny black there's tiny black dead these were solid red last month I mean you couldn't find green but they're they're done so a red drift is a great showy barter as the other drifts that I mentioned to you my favorite for this area red drift coral drift peach drift is an awesome one has varied shades of color on it and the sweet drift which is a pink um, let's walk on over well I do want to mention these before we leave this side we have replaced a couple of the old ones in the trial and this one is doing very well she was put in the ground last summer this is Duchess de Brabant she's from 1857 she has made the earth kind designation she's one of the antiques a true antique that has made the earth kind designation and uh, she's very fragrant and it always makes my heart happy to see an old true antique make the earth kind designation then over on this one you have souvenir de Saint Anne's which has also made earth kind and it's from 1916 it's in the bourbon class it's a sport of Souvenir de la Malmaison, which is a true antique, which is really my favorite more than this one, but it didn't make earth kind. So, but it's very fragrant and it's a shell pink. That looks white. It's really a shell pink that's faded from the heat. Okay. I do want to point out this rose. I'm, I'm especially excited about having old blush anybody that has sit in my classes has heard me speak of her she is like a progenitor of, of most roses in North America have her bloodline somewhere in them she is from 1751 uh, I always want to say 1757 1751 and her her DNA and bloodline has come down 
for a long time and impacted roses. She's not the most stunning of roses, but right now she's just finished with a big bloom. There's a bunch of dead, dead heads all over her from her big flush of blooms. You can see the, what's left of a couple. But I'm really excited that she's part of our garden and hoping that she's gonna fill up this corner so that she has a place of beauty at the very front of the garden. When people go by, they can see Old Blush. Over here on this side is a rose we've just put in the ground and I'm really excited about her. She's a true antique from 1842. And uh, her name is Baron Prevost. A lovely big cabbage sized pink rose with an awesome fragrance and she's already been blooming. We've just put her in the ground like two months ago. She's already uh, happy where she is and got a bud coming out now and it's just finished blooming so that's a really good sign. We'll go on and talk about a couple more specific roses that we've just put in the ground. We're pretty excited and hopeful for these new ones. I'm standing here by uh, an Esperanza Esperanza does really well in our county. This is one of the uh, Texas star plants that we planted in here. It's also called, uh, uh, it's gold star Esperanza, called yellow bells sometimes. And uh, it thrives. Of course, it has a real, a lot of water in this spot and it really thrives. But generally you'll see that they're covered with yellow bells. And uh, we draw a lot of pollinators in, in this garden onto the roses and the yellow bells and varied things. I do want to turn your attention to a couple of roses. Uh, this one is still very small. Abraham Darby. This is a David Austin rose. If you've heard me teach on roses, you know I always say every garden needs at least one David Austin rose in it. He's a um, rose breeder from um, Great Britain. And this rose has just bloomed. I'm so excited because it's, it's taking hold. It's growing here. It's already put some blooms on. Those blooms are so big and dense and heavy that they it can hardly support them. And they, they pull the plant over. But the fragrance of a David Austin rose is literally to die for. So Abraham Darby. There's several David Austin roses, but Abraham Darby is a very, very great favorite of mine. So uh, I'm really excited about this red rose. I had already planted it in our garden in the wrong place, which, as I've said, a lot of times I do that. And I've told you before, my husband has a PhD. We've been married 57 years, and he he is the post hole digger in our family does not make him happy once he has planted a rose when I say she's not happy here we're gonna have to move her he's not happy about that but we did we moved Frances Debris her name is Frances Debris and I just want you to see she's been moved into this location about three or four months and look how happy she is the red roses and the fragrance of she's one of the most fragrant roses so if you're looking for a red rose, she is um, a tea rose from 1894, an old garden rose. And one of, not only is she gorgeous and red, but she is very fragrant too. Behind her, we have a climber that's an earth kind climber, climbing pinky. Now she will have a huge flush in the spring where she's solid, cushions of pink. You see the, she'll have just big dense cushions and these pink blooms all out. When you have a climber, ultimately when we she gets longer, we're going to run these, turn these out long ways this way because the more you can splay them sideways, the more blooms will come up the sides. Uh, so we'll lay them out even more as she grows. And she is solid pink in the spring. You can see this is July, and she's just been planted a few months, and she's just blooming away. In the fall, she'll do another big flush. So she's a great pink climber, and she's a good pink climber. She's a good pink climber comparatively to Peggy Martin, 
Peggy Martin is much more profuse and it's a great one, but if you need a, a pink climber that puts out a lot of roses that it's not gonna take over, that you don't have a lot of room for, this would be a good one, because Peggy Martin is unbelievable rose, but you gotta have a big arbor or a big room to put it, not a small area. Now I'd like to point out to you a great rose. Like I said, some of these don't show how great they are right now, because it's mid-July, and I apologize for that, but this rose, is the one we've talked about many times called Maggie. This is a found rose. It was found by Dr. William Welch, whom we've had speak to us many times, and all master gardeners just love him. And uh, he named it. And my hope for her, I do have one at my home, and my hope for her is that she gets up and covers this fence and has her red roses just scattered all through, spilling over the fence. She is covered with small red blooms and they are have a fragrance like rose milk like grandma's old rose milk hand lotion it's a wonderful fragrance they're not good cut roses they drop their petals so you'll have dropped fragrant petals everywhere once she gets going she just stays kind of red all the time she's an awesome rose that's what we're hoping for her uh, as we look on down to a perennial that we've put in this is a very popular perennial uh, Stella Dioro. It's a daylily that blooms. I know you don't think I'm telling the truth, but it blooms all summer off and on. And if you can see these little things sticking up, she's just finished a bloom. They will bloom more than normally your daylilies. Typically, daylilies will bloom the month of, of June. And that's what you get one month. These will bloom again in the fall, probably. They'll bloom two or three times. So Stella Dioro is a great poof of gold, yellow daylilies to put into your landscape to give you spots of yellow and then real pretty poofs of greenery. And it stays all summer long and will give you blooms off and on. So it's, it's really a good, good one. Uh, I also want to mention this rose. You can't see the roses on it. I apologize for that. They're about this size and they're white. This is Duché. It's a China rose from 1869 and is, is an earth kind. And it's a great rose. It usually, I have two of these at home. And usually this is covered. It looks like popcorn balls of white all over it. It's, it's a real prolific bloomer, but she's already done that earlier this summer. I do want to point out this rose, she hasn't taken off yet. We're having a water, a little water issue here, We're working with the city to try to get it where we've got some water uh, getting to her. But my hope for her, and the reason she has a spot up here by the front gate, is that she's going to fill in this whole area uh, right here. Her name is Archduke Charles. I guess I should say his name. <laughs> is Archduke Charles from 1837. It's a China rose, a true antique, and I have seen these uh, up in the rose gardens up in Dallas that are this big, this big, and from a distance as you walk up, you have red roses, pink roses, and uh, magenta all different shades as they fade from one shade to the other. And because the rose itself has light pink on the top part and dark and red on the under part. And so the, all the color mixture, it just makes a stunning bush once you get it going. So I'm hoping that we can get that one going here. It'll be a real asset to the garden. This is one of our uh, Texas Superstar perennials that we put into the garden. She's just had a haircut. I have to keep her cut because she wants to take over. As we all know this about Lantana, this is Lantana New Gold, which that particular variety has made Texas Superstar. And uh, she goes crazy. If you have a place to put your Lantana that won't take over your roses, I do have to say, planting Lantana right next to a rose is not the wisest thing, as you see I've done. Um, they'll take over a rose. You have to really keep them cut back. Uh, probably needs to be re relocated, one of the two of them, but 
I have limited rose space and I'm always trying to stick a new rose in as we've done with Savannah. And I'm happy that Savannah decided to give us this beautiful rose and, and uh, something that we can enjoy for a moment. They're fragrant rose, beautiful color, huge roses. Had re recommended this rose to Richard and he was just telling me that he's got one and that it's just doing beautifully this summer. So I'm glad. Now this rose is getting too much shade because it's under my beautiful Vitex, but it's still giving us, rewarding us with these roses. This is, uh, Savannah is a Cordes rose. Uh, that's a breeder from Europe that's like from a century ago. And uh, Mark Chambly is closed now, Chambly's and Tyler, but I sat in many classes given by him. And uh, this is one, of, Cordes is one of his favorite rosarians from Europe so he's pretty high on this rose and some Cordes roses so wanted to give it a try and it's doing well. Uh, I do want to point out as we've talked two or three times about the Vitex another name for it besides chase tree is the Texas lilac. It, it's the Texas lilac so it's another word and all these seed pods are are purple earlier in the in the summer so uh, We'll, we're going to move on now and look at Henry Duhlberg. Everybody that comes and works in the Rose Garden has usually taken home some extra Henry Duhlberg as we have to thin him out all the time. But he looks great in a cottage garden if you've got room. He makes a great cloud-like backdrop for a cottage garden with your pink roses and your yellow black-eyed Susans and and etc out in front he makes a cloud he will take over you have to thin him continually and you have to give him a haircut uh, as long as you keep cutting cutting him back once he's finished with these beautiful blooms cut him back then they'll come out again with more purple more of the blooms for your garden uh, there are smaller ones there's one a salvia called misty that's a really good size it's a smaller it's better than the old small victoria I don't have Misty here. I've got her in a garden at home. I'm trying her out, but she's more manageable than Henry Duhlberg, I understand, because she's smaller. So just remember, if you put Henry Duhlberg, find, have a space for a good-sized cottage garden or a place for him to fill in with a cloud of blue. It's really nice. I do want to uh, talk about a couple of roses here. You're, you're looking right now at a tiny rose we've already zeroed in on its size a while ago we've just put these in the ground i was on a waiting list for this rose i've said in classes uh rose classes by this lady gay hammond that this rose is named after she is a rosarian from houston used to be the head of the houston rose society and has been very involved in the whole uh, organization of earth kind roses for through the years and this rose was bred and named for her they sent it to her to have her uh, test it in Houston and, and see what she thought before they completed it and she just had to fit over it. I have one at home. I put it in the ground last July about this size and then within three or four months it was about this tall and covered. It's a yellow rose. Now I know you can't tell it's a yellow rose as you look at those blooms because those blooms come out bright yellow and then they fade to pale yellow and then white but in the heat of the summer and a lot of heat they go white real fast so you'll have yellow and white all over the bush yellow roses are harder to come by a good yellow rose that will last and so I'm very hopeful for this one hence we have really wanted because we have a lot of pinks and reds peaches we wanted to try to get good yellow rose so I've got two one on each side a matching pair and we're really praying that they're going to do well but she's just been in the ground now for a month and if you noticed all kind of new growth with these new leaves so I'm real pleased with how she's doing i do want to point out back here don't have the name tag yet for a couple of these um, that rose is called will scarlet will scarlet is a 
smaller climber, but it has clusters like like bridal bouquets, clusters of uh, red, uh, deep hot pink to red nosegays of flowers that'll be all over it. It's gonna be beautiful. I'm really excited about seeing how Will Scarlet uh, does for us. So we'll have this climber on this side of the fence and then the uh, climbing pinky on the other. Now, I wanted to also point out Aztec grass. I don't know if all of you are familiar with Aztec grass. Some may be, some might not. I love Aztec grass because of its variegated color. And, and the key thing for me is, unlike the old monkey grass and liriope, does not spread into a straight border. It stays in poofs. Now these poofs, these are new. They are gonna get big and be big poofs and they'll probably camouflage uh, all the way up to the edge of the concrete there. But uh, if you're looking for a border or to some spots of a very variegated color to be in a landscaping or in your garden, these are great to stay in spots wherever you place them and just get big and round. So I'm pretty excited about getting these Aztecs in. And then that leads us to uh, a focal point and a picture of our new uh, guest and, and resident, let's call him not a guest, he's a resident of the Rose Garden. And we're really excited about him. You wanna... Really excited about him, as you can see, you've all seen pictures for the most part, uh, but we are so proud of our new resident and he stands like a century here watching over uh, and loving, I'm sure, how we're filling in his habitat so that he's a little more concealed. <laughs> but if you can see, our artist, Carl Pewitt, did an awesome job and uh, has all different kind of uh, roses that are in the garden, all kind of flowers. He has the Henry Duelberg Salvia, the Belinda's Dream, Duché, uh, Esperanza, yellow bells, all the different flowers. On the back side, he has others. We tried to get a good mix of many of the blooming things we have in the garden. But we told him we wanted him to be lifelike, and we are so grateful because he looks like one you'd run into in the woods in Leon County. So I hope you've enjoyed this tour of the garden and this little bit of history. I hope that you've been inspired as you see all these beds. They're covered in mulch right now, but those weeds raise their ugly heads through this mulch, and it takes a lot of work. And we, we have a lot of socializing and a lot of fun times as we get out here and, and uh, take time to smell the roses. Come join us.